having spent more years than I care to remember in London, um, when I come over, which is now about once a year at this time, I get these waves of nostalgia washing over me. And one reason is obvious, it's because of my misspent youth in the SWP uh, from the 70s onwards. But there's one other reason for the nostalgia, and that is that although you lot are not doing a particularly good job of it at the moment, <laughs> the class struggle in Britain is very straightforward. It's very easy. You may not feel that, but you know, there's a government, it's the Tory government, it's clear, it's a class government, and there's a ruling class offensive, and the ruling class is clear, we've known it for a very long time. In Turkey, things are not so simple. Of course, there is a, a ruling class in Turkey, and of course, there's a government which represents that ruling class, but of course, there are all sorts of other um, complicating factors. For example, that the government comes from an Islamic tradition, and therefore, immediately, part of the country looks at it not as a ruling class party, but an Islamic party and takes a position on that basis. Then there's the national question. So something like um, around a fifth to a quarter of the country are not Turks, they're Kurds. Um, so they take an approach to national politics coloured completely by the national question, by the Kurds' struggle for national liberation, but even that's not so straightforward because now the Kurds, uh, the Kurdish movement, is not arguing for an independent state, but for a democratic Turkey, where uh, the Kurds' rights are recognized uh, by the government. So the Islamic question and the national question, the Kurdish question, act as prisms through which all politics come through, and in coming through the prism, prism are distorted somewhat. Um, here you have neither of those two issues, and therefore I think life is easier. <laughs> now, I need to explain a little bit why the government in Turkey has won three elections consecutively. 2002, 2007, 2011, the first time with about 35%, 34% of the vote, and then higher in both times after that, until in 2011 it was something like 50% of the vote, and after two years into their third term in power, uh, opinion polls still show the government to be 50% and sometimes a bit more, 52, 53%. That needs to be explained. Why is this government, at a time of international world economic crisis, quite so popular and remains popular? And very few people in Turkey, including members of the parliamentary opposition, um, have any hopes of this government losing the next election. So, unless something um, happens which is as serious as Taksim Square, again and again between now and the next general election, looks like they'll win again. This needs to be explained. And the explanation is this. And here I need to go into a little bit of history. The Turkish Republic was founded in 1923 on land which was left over from a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual empire, the Ottoman Empire. So the population in 1923 was very varied. You had Muslims, but you also had Alawites, who are similar to Iranian Shiites, but not exactly the same. You had non-Muslim minorities, mainly Armenians, Greeks, and Jews. 
You had, of course, about a quarter of the population who were Kurdish, and a whole series of other minorities. Very normal. These were the leftovers of a huge empire. However, in 23, what was created was a Turkish nation state, very consciously. And, you know, the usual formulation is Kemal Ataturk, founder of modern Turkey. Leaving aside the fact that individuals do not found nations, it was the case that the Kemalist cadres had a very clear idea of what kind of state they wanted to set up. They wanted, it was on the Western model, they wanted a Turkish, and saying it less loudly, saying it very quietly, Muslim nation state. They, want, they said the Muslim bit very quietly because this was to be a secular state, mainly on the French example. So they didn't stress the Muslim part too much. Now this was a problem because a Turkish nation state, well, one fifth of the country are Kurds, so they're not Turks. Muslim, well, problem is, substantial numbers, even after the Armenian Genocide of 1915, were not Muslims. Armenians, Greeks, Jews, and smaller numbers of other non-Muslim minorities. Um, then, it wasn't just Muslim, it had to be Sunni Muslim, not otherwise, not Shia Muslim. But of course, again, something like a fifth of the Muslims in Turkey are not Sunni, they're Alawites. So the nation, the state which was founded, excluded, or attempted to assimilate the Kurds, the Alawites, the non-Muslim religious minorities into a Turkish straitjacket. And there was yet another problem. Because this was to be a secular state, it didn't really like very religious Muslims either. So it wasn't enough to be Turkish, Muslim, Sunni, you also had to be not, not too religious. Now this in a country which in the 1920s, uh, well, everyone, everyone practically, all Sunni Muslims, were more or less religious. Probably before 1923, uh, they would have de described themselves not as Turks, but as Muslims. So you get this state which is at war with practically all of its population. <laughs> you can only do that, you can only, that, a state like that can only survive through the use of force. Given that Armenian Jews and Greeks are not voluntarily become Muslims, given that other whites will not voluntarily give up uh, their religion and become Sunni Muslims, given that Kurds to this day resisted assimilation and Turkification, how do you run this country? You run it with an iron fist. This explains why there were three military takeovers in Turkey in 1960, 1971, 1980. And in the period after that, there were a number of attempted military takeovers, uh, military takeovers by the publication of a military memorandum which forced the government to re resign uh, without actually having tanks in the streets. There was no other way of doing this. Now, wind the uh, film forward, 2002. This government comes into power. The Kemal state immediately goes into defensive mode, which quickly turns into offensive mode. Because one of the sacred cows of Kemalism, of the state which was founded in 23, of the official ideology of the state, was under threat. You have Muslims in power. Because this government was a breakaway from a rather more Islamic party. Um, this government itself 
has so far not done anything which was which is which can be described as explicitly Islamic, but at least it comes from an Islamic tradition and occasionally speaks the language of Islam. Not very much, but sometimes. So immediately the military command begins to um, plot a military takeover. We know this because the diary, diaries of the chief of the naval forces were leaked and published. And it's a wonderful picture. You get the five uh, chiefs of forces come into work um, at Central Command in Ankara every morning. And they don't discuss any military matters in the sense that we would recognize as military matters. They discuss how they can overthrow the elected government of the country. Now, I often have a problem when I talk about this in the West, particularly, particularly to a Marxist audience, because um, for our, when we look at this matter, for the government, and we're talking of a bourgeois government, we're not talking even of a social democratic government, let alone a socialist government or something, the government and the state machine are at war. Now, this doesn't often happen in the So, with the leak of the diaries and a number of other documents, we know that these people were making extensive uh, plans, very detailed plans, and horrific plans. I mean, it included things like killing Armenians and Jews so that everyone would think Muslims had done it. Uh, it involved bombing mosques so that Muslims would be up in arms and go out into the streets, create an at atmosphere of political chaos in the country so that the military could then step in in the name of re-establishing order in the country. Very detailed plans. Now, the defining feature of the government party, the, the, the current government, has been that it has fought against the military. At the moment, um, I forget the figures, but some substantial percentage of five and four star generals of the Turkish armed forces are in prison. Um, it's wonderful, and nothing's happened. <laughs> you know, Turkey hasn't been invaded by any other country. Um, <laughs> And it was this government which um, allowed the judiciary to do this. Some important major court cases which have ended up with all this military personnel, not just generals, hundreds, being in jail. Um, now, this has been hugely popular in Turkey. And Second issue, because the government comes from an Islamic tradition, believing Muslims in Turkey, who for 90 years had to hide the fact that they were religious, um, couldn't live their religion um, openly out in, the, in public spaces, they had to do it at home. And this also had some very concrete results. It meant uh, for a lot of that time, not all of it, women could not go into university and could not be public uh, civil servants if they had the headscarf, wearing the headscarf. Bear in mind, something like 70% of women in Turkey cover their heads. So that meant 70% of Turkish women, if they were young, couldn't go into university, if they finished education, couldn't become civil servants. So, under this government, these people feel a sense of relief, um, comfort, um, knowing that the state isn't going to attack them for being visibly and apparently religious. Again, that is hugely popular with much of the population. The past 10 years, this government's been in power for 11 years, the past 10 years, those were the major struggles in Turkey. 
Um, and there are many other aspects to this. But that is what um, gave them the main colouring to politics in Turkey for the past 10 years. And it meant every time more indicators, more proof came out that the military, military were planning a coup, the more popular the government became. The more parts of the judiciary tried to close down the government party, the more popular the government became. That's why their vote increased from 35 to 50 percent. Now, parts of the left um, would argue that all this doesn't interest us because this isn't class politics. We socialists should be interested in working class politics. Now, of course, workers in Turkey don't live in another country, they live in Turkey. <laughs> um, many of them are Muslims, many of them are women who wear the headscarf. One of the important industries in Turkey is textiles, classically an industry where women work in large numbers. So you can assume in these huge textile factories in southeast Turkey, in Kurdistan in fact, 70% um, of the women in textile factories wear the headscarf. So they're workers, but they're also interested in what happens to believing Muslims in the country. Again, something like a fourth or a third of the population of Istanbul is Kurdish migrants into uh, Istanbul. So the national question for them is not something you can write off as, oh, identity politics. It isn't. It's their workers. One third of the population of Istanbul means more than one third of the working class of Istanbul is Kurdish. For them, the national question and the class questions are not two separate things whereby one day they're a Kurd, the next day they're a worker. So, and if 50% of the population has voted for this government, we can assume that more or less 50% of the working class voted for a neoliberal conservative party for reasons other than the fact that they're neoliberal and conservative. People voted for them because they were, fight, they were perceived, seen to be fighting the state. So, how is it, if I quickly come to what most of you really want to hear about, um, <laughs> But, but it wouldn't make sense unless I told you what I've told you so far. Um, in a situation like this, it, it is surprising. Now, it isn't what happened in Egypt two weeks after Turkey. is not surprising. No one was surprised. Um, we've been saying, and I'm sure you have, for a long time, the Egyptian people, the Egyptian working class, and the Egyptian poor have un now are aware of their power and they will use it again. They won't take bullshit. And this is exactly what I think now, by the way. They won't take any bullshit from the military. So they'll be out in the streets again. I just know it. In Turkey, this was not the case. It was not the case that everyone thought, aha, there'll be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets fighting the police. If you'd asked me three months ago if this was likely, I'd have said it's as likely as it is to happen in Britain. Which means it's not impossible, but it doesn't look very likely at the moment. So uh, why did this happen? How did this happen? And the reason is this. First of all, we mustn't forget the Arab Spring. Throughout the world, people have watched live on their television screens what's been happening in the Arab world for the past two and a half years. Secondly, people also have been watching live on their televisions what happened in America with the Occupy movement, what happens in Spain with the, uh, um, what were they called, the um, and, and you know, you can keep thinking along these lines. So that's the background, we mustn't forget that. And of course, you know, people in Turkey 
Um, to the Western mind, Muslims are Muslims and Turk, Arab, whatever, doesn't matter, it's all Saracens. Um, actually, it isn't like that. Turks don't like Arabs. Turks are racist against Arabs. Um, what a racist Frenchman thinks about Arabs, uh, most Turks think the same. So it's not, and also, secular Turks would think of Arabs as a Arabs inferior being Muslims. What can Muslims do? Muslims can't do a revolution. It doesn't. Muslims are reactionary. This is a, a, a view which is widespread amongst that section of the Turkish population, maybe 20%, um, who think of the Turkish government, this government must be overthrown by whatever means, whether it's a tsunami or a military takeover, we don't care, but the Islamists must be up. That's 20% in Turkey, and they think the same about Egypt. There's a raging argument in Turkey at the moment about Egypt, where the Turkish Kemalists are thinking, oh shit, I wish this happened here. And the way they do it is by saying, it's not a military takeover. Because if you support the military, you look anti-democratic, it's not the done thing. So if you say it's not a military takeover, then you can support it. It's, a, it's a good that the government in Egypt has been overthrown. So, it, you know, that sort of complicated approach, notwithstanding, Turks are, of course, influenced by what they see on the television screens. That's one. Secondly, there's clearly a new generation, I sort of mentioned this at a meeting yesterday, there's a new generation of young people, um, which I'm sure was the case in Spain and uh, in, in the US and Tunisia, you know, um, who do not like the idea of organized politics. They don't like the idea of parties, but they don't like the government meddling in their lives. Okay. This, again, is a sensitive, uh, sensitive point. It is not the case that the government in Turkey is imposing Islamic rule. But last month, they passed a law which makes it illegal for drinks to be sold after 10 o'clock in the evening. This was immediately reported in the Turkish press as ban a ban on alcohol. It isn't, in fact. All it does is make it rather more like Britain. <laughs> um, and I'm led to believe, that I understand, it's actually much more liberal than Scandinavia, where you can't buy drinks after six o'clock or something. You know, Sweet. but, sorry, Sweet. But of course, if, if there's a very high suicide rate in Sweden, it? <laughs> so it's probably better to drink. But anyway, um, but but this was not an Islamic issue. It wasn't that alcohol was banned. This is just, you can't buy alcohol at off licenses after ten o'clock. You can continue to drink at home as long as you like, or in a restaurant as long as you like. But it pissed people off. Because it's an imposition, it's, it's a restriction of personal lives. Or the Prime Minister constantly goes on about the family, the importance of the family. And recent, last year he said, every Turkish family should have three kids. Right? It's wonderful. At, on the square, there, was, there were these three bedraggled looking um, big beards, long hair, sleeping in the park for 10 days, so rather dirty looking. Three lads with a poster, which is holding up a poster which said, would you like three kids like us? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, it doesn't mean anything concretely, but it pisses people off. So, you know, and of course people can sort of feel there's something a bit Islamic behind it. And of course there is, but it's not being imposed. Or, a year ago, the Prime Minister, out of the blue, said uh, abortion laws should be changed because um, they're too, you know, 
Turkish abortion law is very good. It's uh, the same as here. I think it, even the number of weeks is the same. And he said it should be cut down to uh, two months, three months. Okay. It should be the, the time after which you can't have an abortion should be cut down. Really pissed people off, and there was uh, an uproar about it. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He just sort of threw it out to, to test it, I suppose. But this sort of thing constantly happens. There's, it's what we would recognize as a conservative government. Think of any Christian Democrat government in Western Europe. It's that sort of chipping away at liberties, um, excessive use of the police, which, you know, much more ex excessive than Western Europe. All of that pisses people off. And it's been 10 years, and the military are behind bars, by and large. I wouldn't bet that there can't be a, a military takeover in Turkey anymore. There can. But it's, you know, much more difficult now than it would have been 10 years ago. So that issue seems to have now been settled. So people are moving on to other issues and impositions into their private lives, which half the population half expects anyway, because this is a government which comes from an Islamic tradition, pisses people off. People went onto the square you have read about this and seen it on your telly, so I won't go into great detail. Basically, a few dozen um, people, environmentalists mostly, um, tried to protect some trees which were going to be cut down because the central square in Istanbul, think of Trafalgar Square, and a park about as big immediately adjacent to it was going to be redeveloped. And they were going to uh, build a shopping centre, hotel, residences, etc. in place of the park. So if a few people defend the trees, trying to stop them being cut down, and the police lays in like mad people. And people saw this on the uh, social media and on the little parts of the proper media, the television. And suddenly, tens of thousands of people rushed to the square. And then it didn't stop. More thousands came, arrived on the square, pitched battles with the police. After a day and a half, the police withdrew. It was amazing. People just would not stop. So the police had to be pulled out. And for two weeks, the square and the park were like a commune. There was no state presence. I've never seen anything like that even here, let alone in, in Turkey, there was no state presence in the centre of the country's main city. And there was the usual explosion of creativity, comradeship, solidarity. It, it was wonderful. I've never actually seen anything like it or lived through anything like it before. Now, after two weeks, the police comes in, um, by this time, people are getting tired, um, it's getting difficult living in the park. Doctors in the park, sympathetic doctors who were part of the uh, protest, were beginning to say, look, you know, this is getting dangerous from a public health point of view. So, probably there was a sense of we should now maybe leave behind a symbolic tent with some people in it and come out of the square. The government obviously knew this was being discussed. Nevertheless, they attacked, by which time, as I said, people were getting tired, so they cleared the square. <coughs> so what happens now? What happens now is really interesting, and I didn't expect this either. In about 20 squares, uh, parks in Istanbul, at the moment, every night, there are forums. Some of these thousand people every night. These are local parks. Thousand local people. It's a much more real thing than, than the park in Taksim Square because these are local people. 
in local parks, two or three of them, a thousand people every night, and the smallest, 100, 200, 300 people. So they range in between those figures. And there's an open mic, there's a bit of organization. People get up, speak, now there's sort of workshops being organized, crashes being organized in some of them, communications between the, those 20, 27 parks has started to increase. And when something happens, for example, well, two weeks ago, uh, a young lad was killed uh, in, Kurdish, in a Kurdish city. All, the, all of these 20 or so parks merged and marched to Taksim Square. So what's happened? Again, a very Egypt-like situation. And I keep saying, okay, even these parks, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm old enough to be uh, realistic and maybe cynical about this. Uh, all right, you know, people get tired of these, you know, because these forums start at half eight and go on until two in the morning sometimes. So people are going to get a little tired of that, and possibly the numbers will begin to go down. But what will happen, and this I know, is that next time the Prime Minister does something which pisses people off, whether it's a big issue or even a not particularly important issue, you will get 100,000 people on the square. This is now obvious. People have forgotten about the fear of pepper gas. Pepper gas is a horrible thing, comrades. I don't know what the technical name is in English, because I've never heard of it here. But it really bloody stinks. And your eyes stream, your whole skin stinks. And it lasts for quite a bit. Um, but people just don't, don't give a shit about it anymore. You, know, you get a thousand people march towards the police. They get washed over with pepper spray. And, then, and they sort of fall by the waist, and another thousand people come. That's how the square was occupied to begin with. And this has been happening practically on a daily basis since. So people have overcome the fear of police, water cannon, and pepper spray. And again, I mentioned yesterday, a lot of these people, on the square there was research done. Um, okay. And 46% um, of the people who stayed in the square for two weeks had never been to anything political in their lives before. It's the first, and uh, the average age was 28 on the square. So this generation has completely suddenly gone into political action and completely overcome any fear that they would have had of the police. So Taksim Square will be occupied again and again. I know it. And all the stuff in the other squares, again, the issue of Kurdistan, for example, a kid being killed in Kurdistan, in the past would um, evoke less of a response in, in Istanbul in the West. This time, immediately, the same evening, all these people marched from all the parks. So, I'm going to stop now, but I've left out huge chunks of what really, if I had another half hour, um, I should have talked about, i.e. the political discussions in the park, because this is crucial. There were, you'll have seen, I suppose, on your televisions, lots of people with Turkish flags, both in the park, less so in the park, but more so in demonstrations outside of the park, uh, in demonstrations in solidarity. Lots of pictures of Kemal Ataturk, so of Turkish flag in one hand, Kemal Ataturk flag or badge or something, or bandanas uh, on the other hand. So that needs to be explained. And that, of course, is something which will continue to be a problem throughout all the forthcoming struggles. And again, it's similar to Egypt. It's like, in Tahrir Square, a number of people were very happy that the military stepped in to overthrow the government. They would be the equivalent of the people in the park who were waving the Turkish flag. They are Islamophobic, 
Um, there's a class element to it too, because they consider the base of the Turkish government, in other words, poorer people, more peasant people, people from the shanty towns, to be not fit to govern. So there's a strong class element in there as well. They've come to be known in Turkey as white Turks. Um, all Turks are white-ish, no, not me. Um, but you get the idea. It's sort of Turks who think it's the upper middle class, westernized, western educated Turks who think we run this state. Peasants and religious people and people who live in shanty towns, it, how can they be in government? How can they run the state? Therefore, their flag has been Kemal Africa, the Turkish nation state, indivisible, unchanging. So that's an important argument to be had in the square, in the park, and on all the demonstrations, and it will continue to be an important argument um, to be had because it splits the movement. No Kurd will feel comfortable on a demonstration with lots of Turkish flags. The Kurds were there, of course, um, and in the atmosphere of solidarity in the park, no fights broke up. But at some point they will, because the man waving a Turkish flag is saying Turkish state borders are indivisible. And Turks really are, Kurds really are Turks. That, I think, is the crucial political argument to be had. Second crucial political argument to be had is the importance of being organized. Because, as I've sort of mentioned, find a few words, as I've sort of mentioned, uh, this new generation post 1989 generation is a generation which. Um, certainly doesn't immediately think we need to be better organized and quite often explicitly thinks we need not to be organized. That is a problem which needs to be overcome because unless organization comes out of it, of these movements, they will remain as movements which will ebb and flow but nothing permanent will come out of them. So those, I think, are the two important political discussions that we have. And perhaps you can, uh, we can have that discussion now. Thank you. From my perspective, your reading of Turkish history is particular. Right. So, for example, I think your reading of Turkish history is very particular, which I won't go into, but for example, the military, of course, the so-called secular military has been played an important role um, in the Islamization of, 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 of politics, but after 1980 coup, for example, just, just one aspect. So this idea that there's a secular military versus Islamist population is something that I think uh, overgeneralizes, basically. Okay, sorry if I'm um, speaking there too much. So uh, the, the, the one polarizing... Minute, one minute left. Okay. Um, you present the Turkish government as a sort of Christian democratic. This is a country where amnesty has recently put out a statement saying standing still is still not a crime. So I, I, I find it difficult to see how this is a democracy. Um, but I want to ask you as to why your um, camp, which has you know, this yes but it's not enough camp that gave support to the government, um, I, can, I can support the goals of getting rid of the military, but I, I, I don't understand why this camp plays such a role in silencing those of us that are genuinely against the military or had concerns about the government's um, increasing centralisation of power, or authoritarianism. Um, but also, and also at the same time, we supported um, you know, religious freedoms, headscarves, women's rights, but you, you, know, you, you had this campaign supporting, um, silencing us. So I want to ask you why, basically, and you know, we see the product of that now. We've got five dead, thousands of people injured. Okay. Sorry. 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 I'm going to come across as a bit brutal, but otherwise there's just no way that we can get everybody in, and that's by far the better situation, that we get as many people in as possible. So three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name, is, my name is David. I'm from the sister organization of the AS in Austria. Um, and we were so impressed in Austria by this huge wave of protests uh, about the bravery and the solidarity, the unity in, in fighting the police. Um, we actually had several demonstrations in solidarity in Vienna. 
um, it, it was it really erupted us at this huge wave from Turkey um, came all, all across over Europe um, and as, as, as we as, as, as we feel the, the movement the uprising was not um, I, I mean it, it was about the nature and the repression uh, of the state uh, against the police terror and it was um, against the neoliberal policies the effects of the neoliberal policies um, in Turkey um, and there is a problem um, we've, uh, uh, we experienced in Austria that uh, in describing the, the uprising um, as simply as a protest against Islamism um, after the clearance of Gezi Park um, there was um, um, the announcement of, of, uh, of Erdogan supporters they wanted to demonstrate um, in Vienna and the reaction from parts of the left um, especially from one guy from the leftist Green Party um, was horrible. He said he wanted to send the protesters, the want to blend the protest, he wanted to send the protesters back to Turkey. Like the fascist party is always saying they want to send them back. Um, and, and this is He's a kind of uh, um, um, this, this this attitude of the, the left Kemalist arrogance against the Anatolian um, backward Muslim people. He's a, he's an expression of that. And what happened? Um, first, one minute. Um, the the pro Erdogan demo grew to a massive protest. There were thousands of people in Vienna um, marching, mainly against this racist attack um, of the left. Um, and, and the second, what happened um, is that right, it was an invitation to center two right-wing groups. The most extreme example is from the fascist party, from the Freedom Party in Austria. Um, there were 600 police officers uh, in, uh, at the demonstration and the fascist from the Freedom Party said that would have been, uh, it would have been better to use 600 bullets. Um, so, um, I think the left, the, the conclusion is the left has to find ways in winning over the supporters um, of the AKP and as, at the same time as we stand um, <coughs> together uh, against racist attacks um, and, and AKP supporters have a long tradition in, in fighting against uh, the fascist party, against the freedom party in Austria, at the same time we stand uh, with them um, against racism and democrat democratic rights uh, we also have to confront the austerity measures, not in Turkey, but also uh, in Austria. So this is not about religion, but this is about winning a fight uh, for a better world. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I'm going to take yourself, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to take you at the back, okay? If you can cut, you'd be ready to speak, guys. Yeah, I have a few questions for Ronnie, and, and partly the, the first one comes in response to what the first woman was saying, because it seems to me you had this very peculiar situation in Turkey of this uh, profoundly neoliberal government that through what it's done has nonetheless managed to cultivate a serious base of support among, among the poor, both through uh, allowing people to practice their religion freely through the Kurdish peace process and so on. And that seems to me quite an unusual situation, that you have this neoliberal government that nonetheless retains its popularity. And I suppose my first question is, to what extent is that beginning to break down? Because when you look at the movements, it's not at all clear to me in Britain to what extent the AKP's base has begun to break up and side with the protests. Because that could be a tremendously important uh, step towards opening with space for the left among these layers, uh, 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 among the poor. Uh, the second thing is that you get these very simplistic explanations in Britain, which talk about the protests, I remember unions are moving, there's a general strike and so on. It, it, the reality seems to be rather different. The level of union struggle is very low, and the kind of policies argued for by the, by the top of the union movement are absolutely disastrous in terms of relating to workers. And I, I think it'd be quite useful to hear a little bit more about the union movement and so on and what, what, what's going on there, because it seems very different to the superficial picture that says it's just like Egypt and the workers are moving and so on. The, the third thing, which I'm quite curious about is the question of the economic situation in Turkey because one of the things that does seem to be common to a whole series of areas of the world is that you've had a number of developing, sort of middle ranking developing countries where the government has presided over mini booms that have been 
deeply unequal. I mean, it's true in Brazil as it is in Turkey in that sense. You have growing inequality and a, and a shallow but real boom that's been experienced. One and one of the things that seems to have happened in the last couple of years in the course of the economic crisis is those booms seem to have skidded off course and the, the rate of economic growth seems to have slowed very, very sharply in those kind of societies. And I wonder whether there is something general in which these societies have used the economic booms in part to stabilise the, economic, the, the, the political and social situation and is that beginning to unravel now and is that going to open up in these kind of societies much more space for these kind of explosions and radical political movements? Uh, Chris Stevenson from Istanbul. I'm a member of Marx 21, a current in the Green and Left Party. Uh, we won in Getty Park. There is not going to be a shopping centre. We won before we, we were thrown out of Getty Park. And we won something else. We won that there was no clash between the Kemalists and the Kurds in Getty Park. And the Kurds wobbled at the beginning and then they took full part in the movement. So when in Kadikoy, which is one of the three last Kemalist boroughs in, in Istanbul, which elects a Kemalist mayor, when you have a march with people carrying an Ataturk flag and shouting, everywhere is Lijet, which was where the Kurdish boy was murdered by the army, Everywhere is legion, everywhere is resistance. What's happening is a political revolution. A whole generation are breaking with the existing Kemalist ideology. And it's, and it's a process which has been prepared on the left and required leadership from the left in Gezi Park and in, the, and in the forums, but it's happening. But the problem is that those people are working people on the demonstration. They were working people in Gezi Park, as Ronnie had said, and they go back to work and they're faced with the same neoliberal attacks. The Act Party government has uh, waged a series of attacks on the trade union movement, new laws which make unionisation virtually impossible within a legal, uh, legal framework, new re re redu reductions in, in uh, your, your compensation for getting sacked, so making sack, people, sacking people easier. So the cru crucial question, one of the crucial questions is how do we take this back into the how do we take it back into the workplace? How do we take it back into the workplace? Well, it's just been mentioned that the uh, level of trade unionism in, in membership in Turkey is extremely low. And it's, it's under attack and they're trying to create a, a system where they have trade unions, but they're all under the control of, of, the, of the government. In my own workplace, which has 1,500 people working in, it's a private university, which is an enormous sector in Turkey, and our membership runs from cleaners to uh, professors. What we did was first of all organise delegations, workplace delegations to Getty. Then put, uh, we, had, we were facing a neoliberal attack from the multinational that, that owns our university and trying to impose new contracts on the uh, white collar staff and the blue collar staff. And we put in a leaflet saying, we don't take any rubbish in Getty Park. Why should we take any rubbish from this multinational? And people were being called individually and they were trying to force and intimidate people to sign contracts. And they didn't. And it was, very, it was a very difficult resistance because it was a resistance on an individual basis. We were having to rush around, hold meetings and tea breaks and so on. And we were using the spirit of Gezi in the workplace. And even where we had women cleaning workers who were individually intimidated, we got them, then seven or eight of them go back together and went to their manager and said, you intimidated us, you lied to us, you bullied us, we want to take our signatures back. And on Thursday, we had the management Contact the union and say, okay. We need to stop soon. You've won. You know, we're going to talk to you. We didn't intend to change the conditions with, the, with these contracts. We, we're going to talk to you. And it's very, very important. It's interesting, just one last point. It was easier amongst the white collar staff because they were more, more sympathetic. The blue collar staff, at least half of them vote for the Act Party. Our two leading militants amongst the blue collar staff are a Kurd, a Kurdish nationalist, and an Act Party voter. You need to finish. And uh, uh, that, is, that is the pact, but we're still winning amongst the Act Party voters. We're still winning them in the workplace because they're fighting the neoliberalism, the, 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 the fact that the Act Party supports the rich Comment. against the poor, and that's the most important. Yeah. Yeah. During the revolt uh, of Taksim, I was just glued to various live streams and to Twitter and Facebook because I had grown up in Germany and having grown up with a lot of Turkish leftists, this was like the discussions that were taking place. And one thing, there's two things that particularly struck me. The first thing was of how diverse the movement was and how it cut across all social classes inside of Turkey. The second thing that really showed, and as the movement continued to develop, how far we're actually from socialist 
revolution. And that really saddened me, but it, it just raised another question of how do we break or how does the Turkish how do the Turkish popular classes start, start to break the hegemony of the AKP? And I think the first key for us, of course, as revolutionary socialists, is the agency of the working class. And what we can't forget is that there have been strikes, such as the magnificent Tekel strike, 2009, 2010, etc. Then, preceding Occupy Gezi, we saw Turkish Airlines strikers. Take uh, going on strike as well, and those are traditionally AKP based. The problem, however, is is that they're not striking over political questions necessarily, but over fundamentally economic uh, economic questions, which makes the cross fertilization to the po politics actually a, a role that revolutionaries and a revolutionary organization has to take or occupy Gezi itself. The second point is is of course the Kurdish question, because if you look at what happened, is that Erdogan effectively consolidated the so-called peace process with the Kurdish population in order to feed them some crumbs and you won't resist any longer, you'll disband your organizations and whatsoever. And so the fact that the Kurdish population came out into Occupy Gezi on day three, day four of, of Taksim is absolutely magnificent because what it sent to the Erdogan government and to the IKP is we don't accept the peace process on your term. Final point is, we need to take a lesson out of this. There was a, on the French Consul, there was a graffiti which wrote, France 1968, Taksim 2013, the poetry is in the streets. The difference between 1968 France and Taksim is, is that the general strike effectively didn't succeed in breaking the hegemony. So we need to ask ourselves, what are the concrete lessons we can take out of the current street mobilizations and how can we feed them into the working class struggle? And I think an important parallel is the Oakland Commune and Occupy Oakland and where they used the com o o Occupy as the forum to call for a general strike, maximize working class participation inside of Occupy Oakland, as well as reach out and see the key agency inside, inside of the strike of the longshoremen. And that cross-fertilization unfortunately didn't happen in, in Turkey. Sorry. <laughs> I know, so, go. Two minutes, yeah. Uh, okay, um, I've been living in uh, Istanbul for the last seven years, and 20 years before that, I was a member of the SWP here. So I really want to, I mean, when it's, when it's given a really important sort of context of, of the revolt, uh, the context of the revolt, I want to kind of pull out some of the things that I think are important, uh, more general things about activity and, and what we do for, from the revolt. Because the general, um, well, I'll start with uh, Charlie Kimmer said yesterday about uh, the low level of struggle. In the meeting yesterday, he said about the low level of struggle in the UK. And he said it was down to the lack of leadership in the trade unions and lack of leadership from the Labour Party. Well, um, you know, in Turkey, it's, you know, there's no leadership from the trade unions and we don't have an equivalent Labour Party. So that's really not going to, uh, uh, <laughs> no God's going to come from there. And I want to look at this uh, um, popular consensus of the, of the park being a small number of young people that uh, started it off and uh, from that the police attacked and everyone came out with a fantastic revolt. It's not quite as simple as that. In fact, there was a lot of organisation behind it because for two years, uh, I mean, the development of the square has been going on for some time, the plans for it have been going on for some time, there's been a lot of no consultation, but an awful lot of uh, people coming together to try to affect that uh, uh, development. And for the last two years, there's been a, um, a united front of 80 organisations called the Taxim Platform that has been uh, operating and, and, and working to try and stop the, or try to affect the, the development, which has meant producing leaflets, going to meetings, standing at the, uh, at the uh, stations, giving out leaflets and these. And the people doing this, were, uh, were actually the grey-haired uh, older people involved in these organisations. So, um, when the occupation happened, you had a whole uh, massive uh, united front uh, supporting the occupation. So when they first came, when the kids first came to, to, to get rid of the, uh, uh, the tents, uh, there was a call from those 80 organisations to come and support. So the members and supporters of those organisations came to support. Um, then when the police came down with more um, uh, oppression and tear gas and everything, that was when there was the spark. That was when the individuals, actually, actually thousands of individuals around Turkey became their own leaders and they kind of, uh, uh, came out and supported it. That's where the spark happened, but there was a massive amount of organ organisation behind it. And I think that's really important in terms of uh, 
are here and being involved in the United Fronts, uh, and, and in all the United Fronts, because you don't know where that spark's going to come from. Finally, um, when that happened, uh, uh, the debates within the park were really, really important, and it was, it was socialists that argued about, that understood the uh, tensions and the uh, contradictions within the ideas within the park that were able to keep down the level of tensions with, with, the, uh, with, the, with the nationalists. And, um, and I think that an important point is to remember that, it, you know, from the, the SWP is an internationalist uh, organization, and we're very weak, aren't we? <laughs> we're very tiny in, the, in, in, in Turkey. And so this organization, the SWP in the UK, is, as part of that internationalism, is incredibly, incredibly important for the struggles that are breaking out. They're not breaking out here at the moment, but they are breaking out. And the SWP is an incredibly important school and experience for us where, uh, where we are to doing this, uh, what we do have this. There are many, many things to say that uh, we can say, but like, firstly, I can come from the 20% where the uh, population thinks that the government must be overthrown by all means, and we're very ex uh, excited <laughs> by the Egyptian process. But in that city, we were holding the forums, and in the forums, the, uh, once, like, from an outsource, the national anthem started and uh, people were excited, they didn't know what to do, should we stand up or not? And half of the groups stood up and half didn't. But if it had ha happened before in the city where I live, like there would be mass uh, fights. So this was the change uh, that happened and I think that our party as the Revolutionary Socialist Workers Party can grow by this means in this process and has gained a lot of new members as well. I would like to say something to the yes, but <laughs> not enough sufficient process. And uh, I'll do that. Too. But uh, like we have the peace process going on right now, and in the first days of the Gezi Park, we were scared if the process will be halted by that means because there were nationalistic forces on the way. But we know that in Turkey, people are not politicized, and they use the Turkish flag uh, as a means of being politicized in a way, but they don't know why they are using. So it's very vital for us, in, by that means, is to be on the streets and tell them that this is not the way and uh, we should lead the way in the context of the revolutionary movement. One minute. And, uh, well, there was uh, a lot of things to say, but <laughs> uh, we think that it's necessary uh, the peace movement to continue and go on, even if the government is continuing it, because the freedom of the Kurds is the precondition for uh, equality and freedom in the country. So the peace process is the precondition, it must be carried down by all means and we should take it onto the streets and negotiate with people that the peace process is not only the government's, it's, uh, it's ours. We should not say that the uh, government is, uh, like, we, if a government supports a peace process, even though the government is not legitimate for us, I think that the peace process should be continued on. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, one of the uh, one of the main strengths of the uh, movement was that the government did not categorize the movement. The government used to say that these are the nationalists, these are the pro-army types, these are the people who wants that army rules the country. But this time, uh, the, 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 this didn't work because there were all sorts of people, all sorts of uh, young people in the uh, in the park. So uh, the government did not do it again. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the things I want to stress is that this is the part of a uh, global movement. This is the part of Arab speak, this is the part of the occupying movement and so on. Because uh, I can give you two examples. In the forums, in the assemblies, we use the same uh, hand signs in the uh, movement in the Spain, uh, in the Puerto del Sol. And uh, the other example is, yes, yes, this, this uh, science. And the other example was this, there were uh, libraries in the move, in the park, uh, like, just like in the Occupy movement, in the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement. Uh, <laughs> for a long time, I, I said that people can change in a movement, people can uh, abolish their own thoughts. And I see this in a very concrete sense in Texan, because I, I see that uh, the 
uh, uh, supporters of the football teams came and they were used to uh, raise many slogans both homophobic and both sexes and both severe the sex workers and the first interesting thing was that there were sex workers in the park and there were LGBT people in the park and one of the main leaders of the uh, football fans in Turkey apologized them uh, publicly uh, and they said this is no more, we don't want to say this no more. There was, a, uh, there was a media blackout uh, uh, for the protest because of the protest, and people uh, started to say that uh, these are, this is the media. We learned everything from the uh, uh, of the Kurdish movement. The, the media said that Kurdish movement is all wrong, they are all killers, so people are now thinking that this is all wrong and they should reconsider the Kurdish movement. And uh, the last thing I, was, I want to say is that uh, Taksim was amazing and there was, uh, for 10 days, uh, there was no state in the center of Istanbul and uh, we didn't use money for our, uh, for our needs because there were all supplies and food and everything. But the main thing was when the police attacked, it all gone. So we saw that there was no uh, space of freedom alongside the state power. So uh, I think the main challenge ahead of us is the sad people that this is not only about the government but, but state because uh, overthrowing the government is not enough but because of police brutality and other things are because of there is a, there is a state repression and the capitalism. Thank you. Sorry, this will our, our Turkish uh, friend here will be our last speaker Hi. to give Ronnie time to sum up. Hi, good. My name is Mehmet. I'm from Irish Eastern UP and also uh, from Turkey. And I spent uh, four or five days in Gezi Park uh, just before the last brutal attack on Saturday. And I did interviews with 27 different organizations. Some of them are published them because we need to be translated. And as Ronnie Berlin explained and other speakers have explained, it is an eye opening experience and it was an experience that will stay with us and will have long lasting consequences, I think, in terms of the state, in terms of the government, in terms of the opposition to the government, because they are not very comfortable either in terms, in terms of what's happening yet. There is nothing guaranteed for them either in all of this process. I'm not going to go too, speak for too much, but the important thing here to understand is actually a lot of cliches, a lot of stereotypes, and a lot of sort of taken for granted situations in Turkey have been all up in the air here now, and what they're all up for discussion and debate. First of all, the fear of police, and you need to understand that it's a, it is a police state, it has been a police state. 165,000 tear gas have been fired upon people, right? And as says foreigners like me coming from Euro into sort of to stir things up, but it's okay to import foreign tear gas to fire upon us on <laughs> Uh, Erdogan's government called upon the mothers to say, come and pick your children from the park. We cannot guarantee their safety and their lives. The mothers, of course, came not to pick up their children to form a chain of uh, human chain to say, continue on, my child, but your mother is here, right? Of course, the media. I mean, for 30 years, people have been talking about the Kurdistan and what's happening in Kurdistan through mainstream media. For the first time ever, Istanbul have recognized what may have been deported from Kurdistan or what may not have been deported. And they, I think they are now understanding, we are now understanding what the neoliberal media the institutions are doomed, people or not doomed, right? That has been explored, exposed now when people are asking these questions. I mean, the, yeah, and, and, and of course the government has been exposed, Erdogan has been exposed, and, and I think the fear of the state and the state mechanism, the state bureaucracy, the state elected and appointed officials and their lives have been exposed, and this can only be good. Erdogan's government has, has had to learn how to be defeated politically and as far as the park is concerned and people in Turkey needed to know and experience a, a, a win and they have experienced that as well. So Erdogan has learned how to be defeated in a small way, maybe, but in a very important way. And I think that's going to continue as far as I can see and I'm sure Ronnie will continue explaining us what the, what the next steps are going to be. And this is a serious amount of victory, I, I think, for the country, for the people. And, and no other government following these events will be ever comfortable in Turkey. No other government. The first comrade who spoke was having an argument with me, which was an important argument on the Turkish left. Given that I have ten minutes, I'll spend two or three minutes on it. Two and a half years ago, in September 2010, the government announced a referendum on changing 29 articles of the Constitution. 
The Constitution, which is still the country's constitution, was brought in after the 1980 military takeover by the military. So, the government said, we're going to amend 29 articles and took the issue to a referendum. Three points. First of all, Article 1, temporary Article 1 of this constitution said, the people who carried out the 1980 military coup cannot be tried. This was going to be abolished. <coughs> Secondly, the, um, the article of the Constitution which said military personnel cannot be tried in civilian courts was going to be abolished. It was, and that's why hundreds of generals are now in prison. Um, thirdly, there was nothing amongst the 29 changes which made anything worse for the working class, the opposition, the Kurds, or anyone. And some of the articles were very interesting. Most importantly, the Turkish people, for the first time in history, were going to get a chance to make a home in a constitution brought in by the military. People would have voted against the military constitution. So, we came up with a slogan. It was a yes or no vote, yes to the change or no. We came up with a slogan of yes, but not enough. Not enough because we want the whole constitution changed. And this was amazing. There was a yes vote of 58%. And the guess is, not our guess, that something like 5 to 8% of people who voted yes were really in their minds voting yes, but not enough. Now, think of uh, the 2 million people march against the war on Iran in Britain. I think that was probably the time when the SWP was throughout its history most a household name. Everyone thought this is a good organization. Ours was a referendum. You know, small organization, 1,000, 1,500 people, 8% of the vote ish. The rest of the Turkish left called for a no vote. Why? Is it bad that the perpetrators of the 1980 coup are going to be tried? And they are being tried at the moment. No, but anything that a reactionary Islamic government does is bad and we have to say no. Comrades, this is not politics. This is an apolitical approach and it says, I, I'm not interested, I'm abstaining. Yeah. Anything they do, I'm against it. <laughs> Even when they do some good things, as for example the referendum did. But the Tur much of the Turkish left is an unholy mix of Stalinism and Kemalism. Therefore they see the government as Islamic. I don't think it is. Therefore their approach generally is just to say no and sort of throw a hissy fit. And after three years, three years after the event, I still get people when I do meetings say, ah, but you said yes, but you supported the government. <laughs> Comrades, we did not support the government. We supported the right of the Turkish people to vote a crappy constitution out, at least parts of it. Okay, that was the first contribution. Um, five, I'm still, yeah. Okay, um, the unions, Joseph brought that up. Comrades, we have to be realistic. I would love to stand here and say to you, Turkish unions are wonderful and the park, the Taksim Square movement is going to impact on the unions that we're going to get. It ain't going to happen. Because over the past 10 years, over issues like Islam, the headscarf, and related issues which I spoke about at the beginning of my talk, the unions have been crappy. Particularly, there are seven trade union confederations in Turkey. This is a problem in, from the word go. But the more left-wing ones of those seven confederations, early on, were opposed to the headscarf. Now, how the hell are you going to organize a working class large parts of which wear the headscarf when you're Islamophobic to this or that degree. Turkish unions have suffered from that. 
left-wing confederations, again, have, would have said no at the referendum, again. So, there are seven confederations, it's very split, um, and unless it organizes on a different basis and changes its politics, it's very difficult. Chris's example is very good, but this is one private university in uh, Istanbul, which, well, at least when it was set up, was set up as a very liberal, almost left-wing, um, small college. Um, very good experience, which we should, of course, try and generalize, but I think if we're going to be realistic, that's going to take time. Um, the breakdown of AKP support. Again, it'd be wonderful, and I would love to get up here and say, yes, it's unraveling. But I don't think it is, because think of this. The Prime Minister immediately went on the ideological counter-offensive, and the way he did it was this. He turned to his own base and said, these people in the park want a military coup. They want to overthrow us. We are the elected government. They want to overthrow us because we're an Islamic government. This was crap. But his 50% looked at their televisions and saw the flags in the park. There were also cases, unfortunately, and this is horrible, of women wearing heads, the headscarf attacked in the streets by people who were waving the Turkish flag. Probably not too many instances, but one is enough. Because of that, what the Prime Minister was saying, these people are anti-Islam and they want to overthrow us, actually appeared to make sense to his own social base. So, if anything, I think he's probably come out of this having consolidated his own base. He will have lost even more amongst the 50% who don't vote for him. He would have lost any sympathy he might have had. But his own base, I think, is consolidated. So I actually don't think this is the beginning of the end for, for the government. Certainly the park was a victory and there'll be more to come. I have no doubt about that. But the government isn't, is very far from being a lame duck if we're going to be realistic about it. And the fact that the unions are in the state they're in, of course, makes that even more so. Finally, the Kurdish issue. Um, there are some problems with what you're saying. It's not a few crumbs. What the government is doing is not a few crumbs thrown at the Kurds. The Kurds don't see it that way. Because, again, you will know from the English media, I'm sure, for the first time in history, a Turkish government and the Turkish state, the secret services, are negotiating openly with the leader of the guerrilla movement, who's in jail. <laughs> now, don't underestimate that. This is a state which, until 10 years ago, officially was saying there are no Kurds. Now, the head of the secret services goes to prison, negotiate with a man who until two years ago was, as a matter of fact, called terrorist in chief, baby murderer. Now they're negotiating with him. So this is a de facto agreement, concession, admission by the Turkish state that Kurds exist and we have been forced to negotiate with them. So it's not crumbs. And the Kurdish demands are things like education in their own mother tongue, um, a change in the Turkish constitution, in the constitution of the country, where the emphasis on Turk is removed. It says where it needs to say it, from Turkey. You can't quite render it in, in, in English. It will not say Turk or Kurd it will say the population of Turkey. Uh, currently, the Turkish constitution is full of references to everyone who lives in Turkey is a Turk. All that is that, removal of that is a demand. Now, and stuff like that, stronger local government and such like. Um, the government hasn't taken great steps in those directions. Actually, on the crucial ones, it hasn't taken any steps at all. 
but they negotiate with each other. And my personal view is that they've already agreed on how they're going to do it, and the guerrillas have pulled out. They will not. They would not have pulled out unless negotiations behind the scenes with our job had really gone much farther than has been declared publicly. Um, finally, again, this is a point about how intricate and difficult politics can get in terms. The Kurdish movement, which takes its lead from Ajalan, is all in favor of the peace process. There's no, they all mistrust the government, but every, all the Kurdish movement is in favor, and they demonstrate this, they show this again and again in mass demonstrations in favor of peace, etc. Um, so, come the events on the square, it was interesting. And we had huge arguments. Do you shout that the, the government should resign? Down with the government. Because down with the government effectively means a coalition of the extreme nationalist so-called social democratic main opposition and the fascist party. Don't forget there's a fascist party in Turkey which gets 13-14% of the vote. So we all pity our Austrian comrades but Come on, you know, ours isn't very small. So, this government goes down. Effectively, today, that means a coalition of nationalists and fascists. And the Kurds look at this and think, they did look at it during the events on the square. Do we want to shout down with the government? Because this government falls, the peace process is gone. They know that, and it's true. Because the nationalists and the fascists have been spending the last few years arguing against the peace process. So it was very interesting. In the end, what we came up with, and this was a serious problem for the Kurds and for us, socialists, what are we going to show? We came up with, as far as resignations are concerned, the chief of police of Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, and a few other cities should resign. The governor of Istanbul should resign. But we didn't say, done with the government. The flag wavers said down with the government because that's what they were there for to begin with. So it's intricate, you know, an obvious slogan. Here, any demo, you'd immediately shout down with the Tories. And no one's going to say to you, look, wait, no, are you sure about that? <laughs> it's straightforward. <laughs> but in Turkey, these things are a bit more complicated. But the peace process is real. And on both sides, not just Kurds, Turks are sick and tired of the war as well, which is why the government has been able to take the peace steps that it has taken, some of which have been striking. Um, so it's a very, you know, it's number one on the, on the Turkish political agenda, the Kurdish question. For a couple of weeks, Taksim Square replaced it as number one, but effectively number one is peace with the Kurds. Because you're not going to get democracy, freedom, anything else in a country where one fifth of the population can't even speak their mother mother tongue. So that's another reason for, and I forgot to say this, for the popularity of the government. You know, for, um, because they're not Kemalists, they are nationalists, but they're not rabid nationalists because of the Islamic coloring to their politics. Um, they've been able to take st steps on the Kurdish issue, which a nationalist government, i.e. any other government in Turkey, would not have taken. This also explains part of their popularity. <laughs>